Hello and welcome to Biofilm News Podcast, the show that brings you to the forefront of biomedical research, biotech, pharma and healthcare fields, and the professionals behind it. I'm your host, Pavel Rozhov. Guy Savison is a South African-born biochemist, best known for his work in the field of apoptosis, or program cell death, specifically caspases, enzymes that are heavily involved in that process. He is also a Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Sanford Burnham Prebis Medical Discovery Institute in San Diego, California. And on a personal note, Guy was one of my mentors and uh, my thesis committee chair. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Guy, for joining me today. I really, really appreciate your taking the time to uh, talk with me and uh, discuss your journey. And this is Biofilm News Podcast. So before we dive into your research and the work that you do with graduate students or anything else, I have to have a, a first question that I was dying to ask you for many years. Do you know why you were called Guy? <laughs> yes, I do know why I'm called Guy. So I'm called Guy because my mother called me that. Uh, and it's a tradition in my family, coming from my father's side, actually, that the firstborn son, his name starts with a G. And it's been like that for many generations. I'm actually a Norwegian descent on my father's side. Oh. So um, my father wanted to call me Gustav after himself. And my mother, who's more Anglo, than, than my father was. I mm -hmm. uh, didn't like the sound of that very much. I wasn't very Anglo. So she wanted to have something a bit more Anglo. So I got Guy, which of course we know is not Anglo. It's actually French. Oh, is it? Okay. That, yeah, that's a logic within my family. That's the story I've been told. Okay, well, that's a, that's a, that's a good story. So I, yeah, I, good yeah, I, I assume you also called your, your, your son uh, with a G too? Yeah, we did. He's uh, Gabriel. Oh, cool. And the discussion I had with my wife, we had a long discussion over that. But in the end, he became uh, my, my sort of uh, patriarchal lineage went out and he got a G as well. Right. Oh, nice. So uh, on the subject of uh, your origin, so you are from South, South Africa, is that right? I was born in South Africa. That's correct. So um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of two other people from South Africa who have... I guess, similar journey to yours in the sense that they, they all went from, from South Africa to uh, United Kingdom. And uh, a hint, I'm, I want you to guess who they are. The hint is one of them is a Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry, and the other one is a world-class uh, literature professor. Do you know uh, who those might be? Uh, Sidney Brenner? Uh, one of them is actually Michael Levitt. He's a Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. What did he get his laureate from? So uh, um, basically, it's uh, computational biology. So the, he was one of the people who, who was at the forefront of starting to do molecular dynamic simulations. I don't know him. I know Sidney Brenner, who also got a Nobel Prize, but he was, uh, I think that was in medicine. Oh, okay. He was also from I South, South, South Africa? Brenner. I met him a few times. I went to school with one of his kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the literature professor is obviously uh, uh, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, a personal hero of mine, who obviously wrote Lord of the Rings. So, so first, I, I guess my uh, questions to you in regards to your uh, work uh, have to do with obviously your focus, which is studying the, the caspases in regards to the uh, apoptosis. So if you don't mind getting us a little bit of a bird's eye perspective on the type of research that you've been involved in over the years. Yes. Um, so uh, as a graduate student, I worked on a protein that was a protease inhibitor. And so at that point, early on, I became interested in proteases and their regulation. And that, that interest has stayed with me all the way through to today. And the reason I work on caspases is not because they're involved in cell death. I work on them because they're proteases. And I really enjoy studying uh, the regulation of proteolytic activity in the way that proteases regulate biological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the caspases regulate a couple of interesting biological mechanisms, as you know, because you studied this yourself. Uh, they regulate uh, two types of regulated cell death, one called apoptosis, another one called pyroptosis. And so therefore, you know, they're sort of, but my interest has always been as a protein chemist, a protein engineer, rather than as a biologist, I have to say. Mm -hmm. And it's just by fluke, I've ended up in the area of uh, regulated cell death mechanisms. And actually, I think that uh, the early work I did in that with my collaborators, who are more biologists than I am, uh, kind of set the scene for the fact that I'm now known to be a caspase guy. I reject that. I say I'm a protease guy. And the caspases are just one type of protease. I'm interested in all types of proteases. So my interest from the kind of the high view is 
in the regulation of biological events by proteolysis. Mm -hmm. Just like some people are interested in the regulation of, prote of biological events by phosphorylation or by sort of uh, ubiquitination, for example, I'm interested in the regulation by proteolysis. Um, and so have been for a long time since I was a graduate student. So and I kind of got that interest, but shifted fields because I come become interested in different families of proteases at different times. Yeah. I have to ask, obviously, the question uh, that I've seen in, in your slides and your presentation, that famous uh, New York map of proteases. Where did, how did this come about? So that came about because uh, I saw a, something that I think uh, Tony Hunter and his colleagues have put together called the Kinome in which they had this kind of branching network of um, relatedness of different protein kinases. And I thought I'd try to do something like that for proteases, and, you know, to show the relatedness and the origin and the different groups of proteases. Mm -hmm. I tried to put it together and, um, and it was very difficult actually. I, so I asked Tony Hunter, I said, how did you do that? What kind of program did you use? He said he didn't use a program. He just had a couple of graduate students working hard in PowerPoint. <laughs> And so I decided I wasn't going to like dedicate a couple of graduate students to do it. So what I did is I took an existing map, which was a New York subway map, and superimposed on that the branch lines and so on, the proteases, and to show the relatedness. And so the relatedness is, is described very well by the, the New York subway map. Yeah. So it was just a way of kind of having people remember the different families of proteases and the kind of landscape that they occupy in the, in the proteome. Has this has this particular map and specific picture been actually published somewhere, or this is just like, like... Oh, it's published. Yeah, it was published in a review we put together a couple of years ago. Oh, that's that's so cool. So when you say uh, proteases, and what what do you think is the the most exciting part about studying proteases versus so many other different enzymes? What interests you in that? So proteases um, are very easy to target. They have a specific activity that can be examined by biochemically and biologically and chemically. They're really good targets for therapeutic intervention. And we know, for example, there have been some huge successes along the way, massive failures as well, but huge successes like HIV protease, hepatitis C uh, protease inhibitors. So hepatitis C is now, now a, a disease of the past. It's been re controlled by protease inhibitors. And we know that some of the the sort of drugs that are used to regulate HIV or protease inhibitors as well. Mm -hmm. And the blood coagulation network, the blood coagulation network is a kind of hodgepodge of proteolytic events. And that can be controlled by protease inhibitors as well. Mm -hmm. So proteases are really good targets for a therapeutic intervention. That's not the only reason to be interested in proteases. <laughs> Another reason to be interested in them is that, uh, you know, they're just, they're really interesting. You know, I, I, I have to tell you that my interest in, in science, it's really discovering new mechanisms. And the mechanisms that regulate their activation and, and influence their ability to conduct their biology just fascinates me. And I study that because I can. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our scientists talk a lot, waffle a lot about why they're interested in certain things. And the, what they often don't say is they do it because they're good at it, because they can do it. And this is, I, I'm, I've become good at it and I can do it. And so that's my, and myself and my lab members over the years have developed, you know, the ability to understand proteolytic events. And uh, so we do because they're, we do it because they're there as well as because they're good targets for therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, long, a, lot of, a lot of complex interactions there. So do you see that uh, the work that, you've, that you and your colleagues have done over the years have really uh, paved the way for... Um, and sort of laid the foundation for development of novel therapeutics targeting proteases. Is that kind of the, the major achievement that you, that you see for yourself? Yeah. Um, so uh, we don't tend to be a very translational lab. We're a sort of basic science lab. But in understanding the basic science, you know, other people take forward our discoveries and, and can translate them. And I'll give you an example that you may be aware of, our IAP antagonists. Mm -hmm. So IAP antagonists are, are proteins, they're natural proteins that are able to uh, reverse the inhibition of, of uh, caspases by caspase inhibitors. So we actually uh, identified some of the, the first IAP that inhibited caspases and proposed the use of, of that understanding to engineer 
small molecules that would ablate the interaction and therefore reactivate caspases in cancer cells. Because the inhibition of cancer, as we know, the inhibition of apoptotic cell death is one of the hallmarks of, of, of uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. And we thought we could act, if we could activate apoptosis and program cell death, that form of program cell death in cancer cells, we might be able to uh, derive some therapeutic benefit. And so that was later developed by a couple of uh, big companies as uh, to what is known today as IAP antagonists and sometimes called SMAC mimetics. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the contributions that, you know, understanding the basic interaction of proteins with each other leads towards therapies. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, that's not even inhibiting a protease, that's activating a protease. So again, understanding the biological, the natural biological regulation leads towards ways to, to influence um, uh, enzymes for therapeutic benefits. So that's one of the examples I can give. Mm -hmm. In terms of inhibitors, protease inhibitors, uh, I don't think we've been able to, uh, none of our work so far has led towards the development of novel protease inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking back at uh, all, all, all the way from doing your work as a graduate student and, and now, what are the, the, the most uh, profound examples of experimental challenges that you have faced over the years and how did that sort of evolve over time from where you started to where you are now? So what I found is CRISPR came too late. I would have liked CRISPR to have been developed 20 years ago <laughs> because you know, what we were doing is what we're interested in understanding fundamental mechanisms and then in a, in, a, in a very much in vitro setting in a test tube so we can reconstitute purified components and find out how they work and that's great but you know actually demonstrating that's how they work in, in vivo or in whole cells even is a very different question and so the way that we proposed to do that was to understand the fundamental mechanisms and then go into cells and even organisms and uh, reconstitute particular proteins with mutants of those proteins and then test whether the hypothesis we came up with for purified components would actually result in um, understanding and, and validation in a biological system. And so uh, the way to do that, we propose the way to do that would be to develop a mechanism where you could mutate specific amino acids in a protein and in an in a, in a actual cell. But of course, we didn't invent that. We just proposed that would be the way to do it, just as some kind of thought thought for the future. This was a long time ago. And then CRISPR was invented uh, and like 20 years after we were thinking would be, that would be really useful for us. And so we, we jumped on the CRISPR bandwagon wagon with everyone else, of course. Mm -hmm. And that is now proving to be a very in interesting way of validating or actually testing the hypothesis you come up with with in vitro. So I say the biggest challenge has been to translate your understanding of biological mechanisms in a test tube into a cell and an organism. So would you say that uh, because of the fact that you did not have techniques such as CRISPR early on, this created maybe uh, unnecessary ambiguity in the, in the types of um, discoveries that were made early on? Pavel, that's a very interesting question. I'd rather dodge it, but <laughs> I, I won't dodge it because I think that's a very good point. I think that that probably is one of the one of the reasons is uh, that they did create a lot of ambiguity because you were, you were stuck with these proposals that you developed from very, very purified in vitro systems. And you proposed that that's the way that it, 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 things would happen in vivo, but it was almost impossible to test it. So I'm sure that led to a lot of ambiguity. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what do you think is the, the well, most... The, the Rousseff effect. <laughs> sure, I'll take it. So what do you think is the uh, look of the, uh, of the apoptosis field now and uh, what has been answered uh, that you always wanted to know uh, when you started this, this work? Yeah. Um, the look, so the apoptosis field was kind of descended on me because I was interested in caspases. Before they were called caspases, they were called, they were, didn't have a name for, for this family. Mm -hmm. So um, there were just kind of individual proteins that we worked on. And uh, so we built up a knowledge base of those. And uh, I've always believed that if you want to understand how a protein family works, you have to work on all members of the family, not just one. You know, you have to work on, if not all, at least half of them. And so we've worked on pretty much all the caspases over the years. And um, it's very interesting that, I've, I, said, I said to you earlier on, that one of the hallmarks of cancer is inhibition of apoptosis. And this is a classic hallmark that's in the Weinberg uh, sort of um, 
Im images and diagrams that you see, you know, mm -hmm. one of the hallmarks of cancer. And therefore you'd think that restoring apoptotic sensitivity would be a therapeutic outcome. I mentioned IAP antagonists, but that's, there's also BCL2 or BCL2, BCLX antagonists that you've actually worked with. Yeah. And these are the only, as far as I know, the only drugs that are actually being, the, the, the issue is that I would love to have seen more progress in so sort of unveiling apoptosis inhibition to drive forward uh, cancer therapy. So there are two, two outcomes from that, there are two thoughts about that. One is, I wish we, would, we could have done a little bit better. Secondly, maybe apoptosis inhibition isn't such a big hallmark of cancer. What do you think? Um, I happen to uh, have a sort of counter question almost to that instead of an answer. And you mentioned BCL2 uh, proteins and the inhib inhibitors of that. So it seems to me, as you say, that the, um, uh, the drugs that are available on the market against BCL2 specifically are fairly successful in terms of their very selective and uh, very potent in terms of their activity, side, uh, side effects uh, sort of aside. But it, these proteins are actually not enzymes. So do you think that because they're not enzymes that they actually have slightly more, they have a different role in, in the cells to play as compared to say caspases or other proteases that are involved in apoptosis? Would you say that's the reason why their, their uh, trials have been like less successful in terms of developing these inhibitors? Well, that's a really loaded question. And um, one of the reasons these trials have been less successful is because, um, you know, historically or like theoretically, I guess, but, you know, practically as well, maybe, blocking protein-protein interactions has always been said to be more difficult than inhibiting enzymes. And so with the things like IAP antagonists and your BCL2 antagonists, the BCL2 works as a protein interactor. It interacts with, it's an anti-apoptotic protein that interacts with pro-apoptotic proteins. And blocking that interaction is the therapeutic outcome that's looked for. To free the, so sort of like, block the anti-apoptotic um, function and enhance the pro-apoptotic function. Mm -hmm. But making, you know, according to medicinal chemists, uh, compounds that target protein-protein interactions are more difficult to develop than to, and compounds that target enzyme active sites. So that may be part of the answer to the question. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, so I, I would say that there is still work to be done as, as always. So do you think like there is going to be any major uh, development in the next five years in the field of apoptosis that we haven't really come across yet? Yes. I think that we need to understand apoptosis better. We need to understand cell death better. Um, in the textbooks now, you pretty much find that the form of, of regulated cell death, or sometimes called programmed cell death, that's most well known, if not the only one, is called apoptosis. But I mentioned paraptosis earlier on. There are a number of, of uh, regulated cell death mechanisms that are becoming apparent. And it's not clear whether chemotherapy, for example, activates apoptosis or activates other types of um, regulated cell death mechanisms. So I think that understanding importance uh, of apoptosis in the sort of whole panoply of regulated cell death mechanisms could become a very important issue for the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, now that we've talked about your uh, scientific career, I'd like to uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about your other shoes that you are filling currently, which is uh, as a dean of a graduate school of biomedical sciences, which I was a part of. So to un uninitiated and to all our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about that position and, and the graduate school. Right, so I've been interested in, uh, in education or graduate education for quite a long time. Before I came to San Diego to, to our institute, I was at Duke University and uh, I was in, the, in one of the medical departments there. And uh, when I joined that department, the chairman asked me if I could be director of graduate studies. I had no idea what director of graduate studies was. So we lo I looked into it and I thought, oh, that could be fun you know, working with graduate students and uh, helping them to uh, find the right labs and helping them to, you know, design courses for them. And I got really interested in, in designing innovative courses for graduate students. And then when I moved to San Diego, I kind of brought that ethos with me. And we didn't have a graduate program at our institute. You might not know this. The graduate program is what? Yeah, actually, we probably do know this. It's We're about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And so we started a graduate program and I was kind of designated as the person to get it going. And I, I, I loved that idea. I thought that was great. So it was a real 
grassroots initiative from our faculty. They wanted to have a graduate program. They wanted to have graduate students and they wanted to educate them in courses in a kind of innovative way that, that other institutions were not doing. And so that's what, that was the exciting part is we wanted to, we're all scientists, you know, scientists are experimentalists and we're experimental in education as well, I think. So we tried some experimental mechanisms to educate our students, which included very small classes, included hands-on, um, uh, what we call now flip the, flip the classroom, where we asked the students to get involved in teaching each other and presenting, uh, rather than just lecturing at them, we want the students to actually get involved in the educational process. So we were able to do that because we're a very small institution. We didn't suffer from a huge um, administrative load like most universities do. So we could move nimbly through uh, modern educational methods. And that became very exciting for me. And so I became the dean, I guess, because I, was, I had the most experience, because I was most interested in developing these mechanisms. And I quickly brought on board some, some of our faculty who also shared my interests. And uh, we put together the graduate program. And so why am I, so the question is, why am I doing it still? Um, and there's something really exciting about working with the young minds. I work with a lot of old minds, you know, senior professors, sure. and it's pretty boring sometimes. You don't get a lot of new thoughts coming out of them. You get the same old things recycled a lot. But it's dealing with naive, uh, and I use the word naive in the, in the most open sense, and not in a pejorative way, but dealing with naive um, students who don't know all the background to everything necessarily, but are very excited in developing new ideas is just uh, rejuvenating. It's great to, to interact with, uh, with those students. So, and, um, uh, uh -huh. so I guess I would just say that it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so when you had uh, initially um, brought, brought to, to start the, the graduate school, was there already a platform or, or like rather a shared sentiment by the existing faculty that we need that and why it hasn't been started before you came on board? Yes. Uh, not all of the faculty. Mm -hmm. There were some resistors who were not interested in having a graduate program. They felt it would uh, interfere with their science. Uh, but there were other faculty who thought th this would enhance their science. And uh, we actually had an affiliation with the local university here, where, where our institute had an affiliation and we actually trained graduate students in our labs from this local university. And um, this is one of the things that really kind of sort of nucleated our own graduate program is we felt that while we were supervising these students in our labs, but we weren't allowed to educate them in a way we wanted to educate them with courses because they took all their courses at the university. And we felt that that was fine for the university, but for the students that we wanted to educate in our labs, we wanted to prepare them in different ways with different types of courses, different kind of fundamental mechanisms. And so that, that hit the, that um, rang the bell with about, I would say two thirds of our faculty, not the entire faculty. There's still one third of resistors. And that's good. I think that's just honest. That's an honest way. Not everyone has to agree. But those people who, who want to participate, they participate. Those people who don't want to participate, they shouldn't be forced to. And uh, no one should be forced to teach if they don't want to do it, if they're not good at it. Yeah. So uh, summarizing what, what you mentioned uh, about the graduate school, what do you think is the unique value proposition that our graduate school has as compared to every, everybody else uh, in the United States, for example? Well, unique is, a, is, a, is the wrong word. There's nothing unique about us. There's something unusual about us. And I thought it was unique, but it turns out there are a couple of other graduate schools that do it as well. And that is that we take students into, uh, into the program to match directly with our faculty supervisors. And so, as you know, the uh, graduate students in the biological sciences, they spend most of their time being sort of apprentice. And I say apprentice because it's, it is sort of an apprenticeship to a senior scientist or even a, a, a not necessarily a senior scientist, but a fully qualified scientist, a professor, an assistant professor. And they'd spend most of their time learning how to conduct science in that person's lab. And so we wanted to, and, and yet in many universities, they don't actually directly enter into the lab. Most universities you enter into a rotation program and you rotate and it means that you, you know, as a, an applicant to a program, you would be accepted and you're expected to spend a little bit of time in maybe three or four labs for your first year. Mm -hmm. 
and you and you, know, you hope that you find a good match. So we accelerated that process by requiring our, that our applicants make that match before they're accepted. That allowed them to be accepted directly into the labs to uh, to evade the rotation program, which could be good, but can also be a waste of time for some students. Yeah. And we, our class, uh, uh, as a consequence, our class load is much less. And we can focus on the individual students. Now, this is not for everybody. It's for a certain type of student. A certain type of student is like, like, like yourself, who decided, I want to go into this lab. I want to study this kind of thing with this person. That's who I want to be with, you know, for the next few years of my life. And, and as an apprentice, I want to learn that way. But if you don't know that, you should join a, a, a program that um, does rotations. Yeah, and yeah. Maybe once you get in to that program, you hopefully you'll find someone who will be that mentor for the next five years of your life or whatever. So the advantage of our program is that it's not for everybody. It's for those people who've already made the decision about what they want to do. And the advantage is it, it gets them qualified faster, usually. Yeah, uh, I can speak to, to that from experience. And uh, going, uh, going into the program, I was seriously driven by the curiosity to pursue protein structure function relationship. And I picked from the, from the range of the professors and faculty that, that we have in the Institute. And uh, yeah, that allowed me to bypass all the potentially unnecessary rotations and yeah, as a result, graduate faster. So I could, I could see that uh, this would be an appeal to, to a lot of students. So um, as we sit home, uh, and this is obviously the time when we all sit home under quarantine, what are some of the things that go through your head as we all experience this crisis? So we just had a discussion today, which I thought was very interesting, with a graduate program office and a couple of graduate students about, about how uh, the transmission of information is going to change over time as we uh, do everything remotely. And so like 30 minute PowerPoint presentations, just done, you know, filming them uh, by Zoom or whatever um, and presenting them that way. That's probably, the, the, uh, that's probably something of the past. So we need to come up with innovative ways to transmit information. Zoom meetings are okay, but people lose interest and lose focus. For, the audience can lose focus very quickly. And so we need to come up with novel ways of, of uh, transmitting important information, transmitting our re results and our, our research and so on. So we're, we're trying to invent, not invent, but adapt different uh, presentation techniques that uh, are compatible with uh, the life we lead right now in remote with each other. And I'm not sure, with all respect to Zoom, I'm not sure if Zoom really cuts it. I'm, we're still doing the same thing we used to do, which is like PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. And we lose our, we, we notice this with our students. We can lose them very quickly if we don't engage them during the process in, in innovative teaching, teaching methods. So what we do is we break up our, our lectures into bite-sized chunks and we involve the students in, in group discussions as much as possible. So the, the, the challenges for the stay at home era like this is actually getting the information to each other. For example, poster sessions are a thing of the past. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoy poster sessions. Poster sessions give you the opportunity to really interrogate st students, especially about their, the work, um, you know, dig deep, delve deep into their methods and so on. But a, a poster session is the antithesis of today because it violates personal space intentionally and we can't do that anymore so we have to think about ways that we can we can adapt poster presentations and stuff uh to you know the the current uh, um remote uh interaction with each other so these remote interactions i also thought well, by doing everything remotely this is a separate thought right coming in i thought by doing things remotely i would have to work a little less hard i could have more time on my own but it turns out that was completely wrong. I have no idea why it was wrong, but I seem to spend more time engaged with, uh, with uh, my colleagues right now, whether they're students of my lab, people in my lab or colleagues in my institute, you know, other professors and so on. I spend more time engaged with them remotely than I did when, it was, when I was you know, going to the lab every day. That is so weird. That is fascinating. I don't understand the dynamics behind that at all. <laughs> but someone should do a thesis on it. Yeah, I'm sure I was, I was thinking about that myself. When it's all said and done, there's going to be a lot of theses written about that. How are you finding it? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it quite, quite interesting because it certainly caught me a little bit off guard because I was in, after I finished my PhD, I had a, I had a 
chance to uh, just take a breather, if you will, and sort of try and uh, shift the gears in terms of what should I do next. But uh, then the Corona thing happened and now I'm, well, I can't really do much except look for jobs. And now it's, it's kind of a difficult situation to be in. There's hiring freezes, there is, uh, you know, challenges involved in staying home, but you find different ways to entertain yourself and get, get yourself busy. And doing this kind of podcast is something that I always wanted to do. And this is like a perfect opportunity to try my hand. In this, is doing great it. Idea. this is a great idea, Pamela. I mean, I don't know. I hope it'll be successful. I hope it'll bring you success. But um, what we need to do is we need to develop new communication tools. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, so any, any like uh, investigations or any experiments into, you know, different communication tools and paradigms will be very useful in the current setting. So, uh, so on the subject of all the innovations that you spoke of uh, just a moment ago, well, do you think that these are short-term solutions for the situation that we're currently in, or they would actually be a long-term approach that you're going to implement in the graduate school or ov overall? I think uh, we're looking long-term here, not just because we're going to be in isolation forever. I don't think we'll be in isolation forever. But I do think that, you know, if you join a major... Uh, multinational drug company and pretty much most of them are, are multinational right now mm -hmm. you're going to make a presentation to you're not going to make a presentation to people in your lab you're going to make a presentation to people in italy in you know south africa in in china in in india your presentations are going to need to be remote you're going to have to learn how to do things remotely and make them engaging and informative beyond the uh, so i think that we're, what we learn today is going to be very important for our future development as a society in terms of the, you know, if you're a globalist, I'm not necessarily a globalist. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just reality. We are a global society now. And the, the kind of, the need to, to be able to interact with people at a distance is, is paramount in these sort of businesses. Now in academics, in terms of teaching, I'm not so sure. I still like the classroom fellow students because I like the way we can get them to interact with each other but it's much more difficult to get them to interact with each other remotely. Uh, especially, you know, if like today we had a remote session and my software crashed right in the middle of it. That was not good. Yeah. So definitely. we're going to be dependent on software not crashing as well. So a lot of technical issues in the future. But I think that what we're learning right now could be very useful for the future development of science and, and not just business, but science as well. Yeah. So uh, on a personal note, is there something that you think that not a lot of people know about you. And I think this is a good opportunity to, to tell uh, the audience about some of the things that they may not know about Guy Salveson. About me? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, just, uh, just a guy who likes to do science. I like to do it because it's fun, because it's new, because everything we do is new. Um, what else about me? My favorite food is chocolate. Um, <laughs> My favorite drink is nice red wine. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe maybe I'll I'll lead you in, in, into this since you mentioned the red wine. So uh, as you mentioned, you did your uh, PhD in, in in Cambridge, and uh, my question is since I since I was there for for a short time period too, what was your maybe favorite pub that you went to uh, after a hard day's work in your lab? Right. So I actually grew up in Cambridge. So I grew up there from the age of, my family moved there when I was about 11. So when England won the World Cup, it was that long ago. Mm -hmm. I remember watching England win the World Cup, win the World Cup mm -hmm. from Cambridge when we just moved there. And so um, I've been there since the age of 11 till the age of about 18. And then I went to university in London. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Cambridge to do a PhD. So I was actually going to the pub before I was at college. Okay. Because the drinking age was 18. So, I, you know, I, I was last couple of years before, or the first year in college, whatever. So the pub I used to go to is called the Eagle. Oh, well, naturally. Yeah, I heard of that. Yeah. And the Eagle is right in the middle of town. It's where, it's where um, a lot of my friends went. We were all townies. But it turned out the Eagle is a very well-known pub for, from, you might explain to everybody, from scientific point of view as well. Uh, I, I don't want to get on the spot why exactly it's famous, but I think I heard this story, yes. Yeah, it was supposed to be where those guys who invented the concept of the 
helix, double helix, DNA double that's right. helix. That's right. That's where they met, where they met and wrote in the back of napkins, uh, and you know, squirreled their pints around and came up with the idea of uh, DNA. Definitely, yeah. And the idea of DNA, because it was known, but the idea of the double helix. So I had no idea about that. I just went where my friends went. I, the townies went there. The townies took it over from the gownies. So the at gownies. the end of the podcast, I, I'd like to give uh, the floor to my guests to give a, a, a bit of an advice or a parting wisdom to our viewers and listeners and uh, who may be students or early career professionals. So given what we're dealing with right now, what major lessons do you think we can learn from this time? Wow. Dealing what we're dealing with in terms of Corona. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, on everybody's mind. And I think uh, what major lessons do you, do you personally uh, uh, get from, from oh, this experience? So I think that I see, I've, I've read a lot of boring titles of papers, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of boring titles of papers. So uh, when you write a paper, make the title exciting and descriptive, not boring. That would be my biggest uh, advice for the future. And uh, maybe in terms of advice uh, on a career or on a science career. So as you say, I, I think you have a, you have a unique uh, journey with respect to keeping curious and keeping yourself motivated through, you know, basically so many years of research. So I think curiosity may be another thing. Well, so the, there's another side of that. It's like, uh, I really like what I do and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I like science. I like something. I like discovering new stuff. I like reading about new stuff if it's an interesting title. I like working with with uh, junior people, not just uh, just students, but I also work with junior faculty. Um, I like working with them. I like helping them, if I can, through the process of becoming a you know a senior investigator. Uh, so all of that is fun, and it's just just actual fun. So the most important thing is when I come home at the end of the day, I feel like I've accomplished something that something good, I'm, I'm sort of a very, I, I, I get turned on by people who are empathic. I think empathy is something that, that drives me. I like to see people doing well and I like to support their, their um, journey because I've had, I've been very like, a lot of luck in there as well. It's not all by design, you know, it's a lot of luck. Take advantage of your luck whenever you can. Mm -hmm. but uh, be empathic towards other people. I like that idea and see their journey and help them with their journey. And you'll feel good, but you'll never feel bad about that. However, if you kind of oppress and suppress people, I have no idea. I'd imagine you'd probably feel bad your whole life if you did that. So my, my advice is not to oppress, but to empathize. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Guy, for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with me today. Well, yeah, it's great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Always take care, all right? And uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Please subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with latest news and with conversations with professionals from the industry.